alcohol use during a pandemic, skills to identify and address mm -hmm. overconsumption. So like Michelle was saying, even though I developed this presentation with more of a focus on alcohol, this really, you can change out alcohol for really anything. It could be cigarettes, it could be pills, it could be food, sugar. I mean, switch out alcohol with anything and it, it still relates. Um, so that's basically what we're going to talk about today and seeing like uh, building that self-awareness and seeing like, hey, maybe I'm eating maybe a little too many brownies or a little bit too many cookies or something like that. And how can I start to cut back and implement healthy lifestyle habits? Cool. Great. So just like Michelle said, thank you for that intro. I'm from the COPE Center. Um, I work in the community programs department. So a lot of what I do is just working in the community, putting on these presentations and speaking with communities or individuals and seeing like what resources I can share and what they need from me as well. So, oh, there we go. So COVID-19 and alcohol. So this is a topic I'm sure that we're all sick to death of hearing about, talking about and reading about. But as we know, as Michelle was saying too, stress that is, is at an all time high. I think we just celebrated, morbidly celebrated the one year anniversary of going into lockdown and this whole pandemic starting. So that really puts into perspective just how long we've been dealing with this. Like, I think this year time has become, it, it's become nebulous in terms of like one day drags into the next, drags into the next week after week, month after month. And before we know, we, we've we already been in this for a year. And I think like for me, that didn't really hit me either. I don't know about anyone else, but that didn't hit me until the other day when I was reading something in the news or hearing something in the news. And they were like, oh, it's been a year since the country went on shutdown. And I was like, oh my gosh, we've been dealing with this nightmare for a year now. Um, so yeah, so. So and interesting, Jessica. Now I just I want to say one of our clients um, in our poetry group calls it Blur's Day. Every day is Blur's Day. I love that. Isn't it great? Um, but it really feels like every day has been kind of a repeat of the day before. <laughs> there hasn't been a lot of differentiation yeah. in each it's day. It's like Groundhog Day. Have you guys seen that movie? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we're all living a Blur's Day, a Groundhog Day. Um, and I think we're at this point, like what you were saying before of like, okay, now what? Now that we have the vaccine, can we get back to normal, what is normal now? Because even though we have a vaccine, does that mean we're gonna go to the before times, like before COVID or what is gonna be our new normal? So that adds another layer of stress now. So we've been dealing with the pandemic for a year. Now we're seeing these vaccinations start to roll out and we feel maybe a little bit more protected, but now we have this um, uncertainty of what's gonna happen after the vaccine. How is life going to change now? What are gonna be the measures that are going to be implemented? So in a nutshell, stress all the time, 24 seven, even while we're sleeping. Um, so, and that stress leads us to cope in different ways, whether we know it or not. A lot of times we do this subconsciously. We don't even realize that we are doing a specific thing to cope with it. Um, so just a few examples of coping would be like eating. I'm guilty of that. My vice and my defense mechanism has been eating especially sweets. I have a huge sweet tooth. So it'd be like I'd bake brownies or I'd bake zucchini bread, or I'd go out and buy ice cream or something like that. That's my vice, right? Um, others is drinking. Did you I'm, with you, I'm with you, Jessica. You're with me? <laughs> Banana bread, Irish bread, ice cream. Yeah. Junk food, carbohydrates, sugar. Yes. Carbs. 100%. That is, that is my vice. That's my coping mechanism. Um, it just, and it's comfort food, right? Like that's how you, that's how I feel. I don't know. There's just something about it for others. It's drinking for others. It's sleeping. I have a friend her. She's like, I'm too stressed. I'm just going to go take a nap. And she knocks out for like four or five hours. Um, and so we kind of get into these habits where it's like a little bit every day. We're like, I'm just going to have a little piece of brown or I'm just going to have a little scoop of ice cream. And then that turns into a week. And then before we know it, it's a routine thing, it's become part of a routine and we don't even know it. And it can be super unhealthy. Uh, so stress and alcohol. 
again, switch out alcohol with anything else and it still applies, but for alcohol specifically, um, sometimes we use it to cope with stress and we use it as kind of to self-medicate, which is what I was talking about before, where we feel stressed, we feel down, depressed, sad, angry, and as a way to self-medicate that to kind of like distract from the pain, to distract from all the feelings and all of the emotions, we use alcohol or in Patty's case, or in my case, we use carbs. Um, but I'm here to say that we should normalize this in terms of, I'm not saying normalize the behavior, I'm saying normalize these conversations. Like we should have these conversations about, hey, I'm having a tough time and I'm using, I'm eating maybe a little too much or I'm drinking a little too much. Let's have these conversations. It's not something that we should feel ashamed about. It's not something that we should hide. Um, there is a lot of stigma on Fortunately, there is a lot of stigma with alcohol and with anything really um, that you're overindulging. There's a little, there's going to be some stigma. There's going to, you're going to have that fear of, you know, friends or family criticizing you and saying like, oh my God, like, what are you a drunk? Or, oh my God, you're like, you're fat. Like you're, all you're eating is brownies or something like that. So it keeps us from talking about it. And if anything, it pushes us more into those unhealthy behaviors. So. I say, we talk about it, like what's going on? How do you feel? Confide in someone that you trust, find your tribe. And when I say find your tribe, find the people that you feel comfortable with, that you trust to have these conversations with and who will support you um, to develop and implement healthy behaviors. So really briefly, just to kind of give everyone a sort of overview of what we've been seeing for the past year or so, in May of 2020, and this is just to kind of give a perspective, May of 2020, we were what, like three months deep into the pandemic at that point, everything was shut down. We were stuck at home for days on end. Um, there was no movement, the streets, it was like, you know, those old Westerns when you see like tumbleweeds and stuff like that. That's how it felt like to me, where there was like no, no movement whatsoever. There was like no signs of life. And there was actually a survey done of 832 adults here in the US. Um, and 60% of those adults reported an increase in drinking. And what I really liked about this survey is that it actually asked like, well, what was the reason for the increase in drinking? What was happening? What was going on? What, was you, what were you feeling? 45% of the respondents said that they were stressed. So that's why they were, they were drinking more. It was stress. And then 34% stated that they were drinking more because, well, it was available more because you were stuck at home. So you had the whole fridge to yourself. Um, you had nothing else to do. So maybe you had a beer in the at noon and then maybe midday and then at for dinner or something like that. And so you're around them more often now if you have it at home. And so um, that's why there was an increase. Same thing, switch it out for sugar. That was me. I had nothing to do during those months. Um, I was working but working from home but that meant that I could just go over to my cupboard and get a brownie or get a candy or a chocolate or something like that so that's where we're seeing an increase in all of that um, this is another survey this time of a thousand adults um, again 55 percent increased use of alcohol in the past month reasons 53 percent said to cope with stress 39 said to relieve boredom so we have stress and then we have boredom. And this is actually a really interesting um, research done, done by this marketing group called Nielsen Market Research. So they compared alcohol sales from September to October of 2020. They compared it with those same months, but in 2019. And they saw that there was an increase in 26 point, an increase of 26.3% in the amount of dollars that were being spent on alcohol. Um, so that's a huge jump. That's a huge jump uh, just from year to year. And what is the kind of like the mitigating factor, the underlying factor? Well, 2019, we didn't have COVID. 2020, we did have COVID. So that's why we're seeing that huge spike. And we're also seeing that there was an increase of 24 24% of total alcohol sales outside of bars and restaurants. So that, that's like household individuals and households buying, there was an increase of 24% in alcohol sales. 
So that's really just to give everyone kind of like a, a really brief crash course and like, yes, alcohol has spiked. And we're seeing that not just self-reported, like people saying like, yes, I'm drinking more, but we're also seeing it in the numbers too. We're seeing it in sales. Um, alcohol sales have grown astronomically. So it kind of backs it up with what we're seeing. People are reporting they're drinking more, but we're also seeing that, yeah, alcohol is even is being served a lot more now or being bought. Yeah, you know what's so interesting, Jessica, too, that the delivery service that started um, for groceries, you know, everybody wanted yeah. Peapod and Fresh Direct and um, all of those, those slots that people would vie for. Alcohol um, delivery became the drizzly market where people could just dial up or go online and order your whatever and have it delivered to your door within like hours. Um, mm-hmm. So the convenience of that, not even having the shame of, I have to tell you, <laughs> The, I, I have to share this story. When my son was small, mm-hmm. you know, I was like a first time mom and, you know, I would make, you know, I would go to the liquor store like once a week and get my wine. Yeah. However, when he was old enough to talk, he went to school and he said, it was in kindergarten. They said, what did you, you know, everybody went around. What did you do this week? And he said, I went to the bottle store. No way. That's <laughs> hilarious. Time. And then when he told me that, I was like, I think I need to stop going to the bottle store. Yeah. With <laughs> It was called, you know, the Bottle King. Yeah, yeah. Called, oh, the Bottle King, you're right, right. That was his big outing was mm-hmm. he went to the bottle store with mommy. I went, oh, geez. It's fascinating is- how little kids, like you think that they don't notice, but they do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, they, ca- they catch on to a lot more things than we give them credit for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and that makes me think like last year when everything was shut down and it was just like the essentials, like grocery stores and stuff like that. Um liquor stores were part of that i mean like i understand some liquor liquor stores have like water and stuff like that but it just made me think right like liquor stores were still deemed essential and so people still were able to go out on their grocery run and still stop by the liquor store because it was still open because it was still considered essential yeah yeah considered essential what 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 could have happened what would have happened if if that if they had shut had to you know shut down Mm -hmm. interesting Mm -hmm. Also, just interestingly, I've noticed an uptick on non-alcoholic spirits. I mean, we've had non-alcoholic wine for a long time, mm-hmm. but now I'm seeing sales of advertisements for, you know, mixology, you know, cocktails with these non-alcoholic spirits. Have you mm-hmm. seen those? Yeah. Or now they're coming out with, um, I think it was Corona. Mm-hmm. Corona beer came out with kind of like a sparkling beer, but it had no alcohol, but it tastes right. just like beer or something right. like that. Right. So you could feel like you're still having a cocktail at the mm-hmm. end of the day, but without the alcohol, which, exactly. you know, very appealing to me because there's something social and there's something even, you know, something soothing about it. Um, you know, really mixing a nice drink in a nice glass and sitting down and mm-hmm. something romantic about it in a way. Yeah, but for sure. There's something there's like a like nostalgia in it. No. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Because it takes you back to also, I call them the before times. That's what everyone is calling them. Like yeah. before COVID. Yeah. Um, like when I was still working as a counselor, all of my the vast majority of my clients, when they would talk about alcohol, it would be this sense of nostalgia because they'd be like, Well, I think about barbecue and summer and being surrounded with friends and family, with the community and just like sitting down and, you know, talking and getting, you know, getting together and there's alcohol there. So they think of alcohol in a fond way. Right, right. But that's, it's that social aspect. You know, you don't say to your friends, I mean, maybe you say, let's go for a coffee during the day. And if it's at night, why don't you come over for a drink? You know, I would say that to a friend for a drink, you know? Yeah. And that's what, and it's not, again, I just want to reemphasize, it's not that it's bad, right? It's right. not that it's bad. It's just when we're over consuming and it's becoming an issue, that's when we, we need to start reeling it in, right? right. Um, so it's all about moderation. Mm-hmm. So here are some warning signs. Again, alcohol, carbs, sugar, whatever it is, here are some warning signs specifically for, um, for alcohol, if you're drinking more than usual, if at any point you stop and think, and you're like, Hmm, I had wine or beer at dinner throughout the day, or you've had more alcohol than other liquids. So like maybe you've had a glass of water, but then you've had like five glasses of wine. 
that could be a little bit of a warning sign because you're not drinking anything else at that point. Um, if there's a little bit of irritability, if you're finding yourself to be much more irritable than before, um, increased tiredness, there's headaches and noise sensitivity. Um, if you're hiding or you're feeling ashamed about it, that could be another warning sign or you're lying to your loved ones or friends about alcohol consumption. Um, and I think we need to be careful, especially with the whole irritability, tiredness, headaches and stuff like that, uh, because that could also be stress, but it's about what it is, what are the precipitating factors to that? Is it alcohol? Are you drinking more alcohol than usual? And that's why you're irritated and that's why you're tired. Then that could be it. If you're not, if you're not, if it's not any of those things, then it could be the stress or other things going on. So I think it's really important to be self-aware and to be in tune with yourself and kind of like take a step back and do kind of like a little inventory on yourself where you're just like, how am I feeling today? How, how much have I been sleeping? How much have I been drinking or eating? How am I feeling about that, et cetera. So you guys don't have to raise your hands at all, but just this is just something for you guys to reflect and think about. You guys don't even have to comment if you don't feel comfortable, but raise your hand figuratively if you want, if you think you've had one too many beers or glasses of wine in a day. Um, I would raise my hand for that, but I would switch out beers and wine for sugar or carbs or brownies, cookies, et cetera. Um, raise your hand if you found yourself gravitating towards alcohol or sugar or carbs more than usual. Um, raise your hand if you've noticed your drinking or eating or sleeping has increased. Um, and raise your hand if you've had alcohol as a way to deal with stress. So like if you've ever thought or said out loud this sentence in any iteration, I'm so stressed, let me just have one glass of wine. Or for me, it'd be like, I'm so stressed, let me just have a brownie or let me just have a scoop of ice cream, or let me just have some pasta, whatever it is. Um, that is a signal that we're, that's our coping mechanism. We're trying to cope with the stress and stuff like that. Um, and where it becomes an issue is like, we're constantly stressed, right? Especially now because of the pandemic, we've been dealing with stress, like I said, 24 seven for an entire year now. So it can become an issue if every single day you're like, I'm so stressed, let me have a glass of wine. I'm so stressed, let me have a brownie. Um, does that make sense? But I'm here to tell you, uh, easier said than done, but I'm trying to tell you, don't worry about it. You're not alone. Um, you're not the only one dealing with it, with whatever, it is, with, with whatever your vice is, you're definitely not the only one dealing with it. Like I was saying, my self-disclosure, I love carbs, I love sugar. Um, that junk food, that's my thing. And that's how I come for myself. And I know I'm not the only one, right? I know I'm not the only one dealing with that. I've spoken with coworkers and we've all lamented of how, you know, we've, you know, in college, there's the freshman 15. Well, now there's the COVID 19 pounds. So we've all maybe gained a little bit of weight from all the indulging that we're doing as a way to kind of soothe ourselves and to comfort ourselves. Um, but we're not alone in it. And we can take at least some solace in that. Um, okay, great. So I've been talking about alcohol and having maybe one too many beers or shots or glasses of wine, etc. But really, how much is too much, right? That's kind of like this golden question that I get asked for, from everyone. Well, how much am I supposed to drink or what, what's the limit, etc.? Well, so this is from, this is like a little clip from the CDC. And this just shows you how much is in each, how much alcohol is in each one, right? So if we have five ounces of beer, uh, beer, five ounces of wine at 12%, that's how much it is. 1.5 ounces of 40% or 80 proof distilled spirits, eight ounces of 7% malt liquor, 12 ounces of 5% beer. That's what it is, right? That's how much alcohol is in each one of those. So when we're talking about drinking that, this is the 2020 to 2025 dietary guidelines for alcohol. You can find this on the CDC website and all of the links that I've used are at the end of the presentation in case anyone wants to go back and 
read the articles or the publications or the journals. I have it all linked at the end of the presentation. But basically, this is just to kind of give everyone kind of like a quick guideline. This is drinking in moderation, right? So for women, it's one drink or less. It's one. And for men, it's two drinks or less in a day for men. Or they also put like non-drinking, like you don't drink at all. But if you do want to drink in moderation, it's one drink or less in a day. But again, it all goes back to, I think this is a good guideline, but we also need to take into account ourselves and what we've noticed in ourselves as well. <clears throat> Some people are like, well, yeah, I've been drinking one glass a day every single day since the pandemic started. That could be a little bit of an issue, right? So it's this is just a guideline, but it's also important for everyone to kind of like reflect and think about what that means to them. Um, so here are some skills to reduce uh, overconsumption. I'm going to say overconsumption. So when you're feeling kind of like that trigger or that craving that you want another glass, you want another brownie, or you want another scoop of ice cream, here are some things that you can do instead of walking toward the fridge, maybe you can go outside for a walk. Maybe you can um, do some yoga or swim a couple of laps, or you can reach out, you can reach out to loved ones or friends. And I put accountability down here um, because when I mean reach out to loved one of, or friends, you know, like make a call, do a FaceTime call, whatever it is but you can also use them as kind of like a support system, right? If you feel comfortable reaching out to them and telling them, hey, I'm kind of struggling a little bit with X, Y, and Z, um, and they support you in it, then you they can kind of be like your accountability partner, right? So for example, my account accountability partner is my significant other, it's my partner. So I'll tell him like, if you see me going towards, um, the pantry to get sweets or something like that, call me out on it, right? Call me out on it. It's a little bit easier for him because he lives with me, but um, call me out on it and be like, well, what are you going to go do? And then that kind of makes me think like, oh, wait, I already had a brownie today, or I don't know if I want a brownie right now. Um, so you can use, um, you can see if they're, they're willing to support you in that. And I think that's a great way of not only kind of, it's a stress reliever, but because you're not hiding it, but you also have someone that's that's in your court, I think that's the saying, but someone that's on your side, that's there to be with you and to support you on this journey. Uh, journaling is another great way. That's something that I've actually taken up during, um, during the pandemic was journaling. I didn't really make uh, time for it before, but since I found myself with so much time during, during the pandemic, journaling has been really, really great for me, at least a little, it's been therapeutic for me to like, just jot down. It doesn't even have to be coherent. I mean, who else is going to read it aside from you? Um, but just jotting down everything that you're feeling, or if you're angry, if you're sad, or whatever it is, just sometimes getting all those feelings out there on paper is such a therapeutic way of releasing all of that pent all of those pent up emotions uh, that can sometimes lead you to overindulging in other things. Um, some other ones that I'm sure everyone has heard of time and time again, uh, meditation is a great one. There's things, there's self-guided meditation that you can do. There's um, like, you can look up videos on YouTube, um, which is great. My mother has actually done that. She's taken up um, YouTube as her her pandemic hobby has been YouTube. And so she's looked up so many videos on that. And so she's, uh, there's, I know there's a ton of like meditation videos on YouTube um, where someone kind of guides you through the breathing exercises and stuff like that. Or maybe it's just calming, soothing music. There's so much of that for hours. There's videos that are like 10 hours long of just calming music that you can put on to go to sleep or maybe for like 10 minutes when you're feeling a little stressed out, just putting those kind of like rain sounds or ocean sounds or something like that is, is enough to kind of get you out of your head space and to kind of bring your stress levels down so you can clear your head and see what you want to do next. Music and art are huge ones for everyone. I feel like um, who doesn't 
enjoy music and art. So putting on music and just kind of like letting yourself zone out is another great one. And this one, I really like this one because instead of reaching for, let's just say a glass of wine, reach for, reach for water instead. Or if you want to reach out for a brownie, like in my case, I'll reach out for a glass of water. And what does that do? That kind of fills me up, right? That fills you up. And that kind of like satisfies a little bit of that kind of like craving urge to eat or drink something. You'll fill yourself up with water instead. So that's another, and it's also healthy because if you're not drinking enough water, um, because you're eating too many carbs or you're neglecting your water intake or you're drinking too much alcohol, if you're reaching for a glass of water instead, one, it's healthy and you're getting your water, you're getting your water in, but it's also keeping you from overindulging in the other things. Um, so here, I think this is really important and I think it's not something that we talk about enough. So when I talk about reduction, like reducing your overconsumption of whatever, th whatever your vices, um, or you're trying to abstain from whatever your vices, that does, that is not the same thing as substitution. So I, f a lot of times what we see is that someone will say, well, I'm going to reduce for the sake of argument, I'm going to reduce my alcohol intake. I'm going to drink less wine. I'm going to drink less beer, less spirits, whatever it is. But then unco unconsciously, they start reaching for other things. So they're substituting their alcohol for something else. So a lot of times it'll be, they're substituting their alcohol, they're drinking less alcohol, but now they're eating much more sweets. Um, and a lot of times we do that without even thinking. Um, we're, we're thinking like, I wanna reduce X, Y, and Z, but we start taking up other things. So it just, it it's the same thing. It negates your effort because then you're overindulging in another thing another unhealthy habit, I should say. Does that make sense to everyone? Yes. Okay, perfect, thank you. Um, okay, so now we're going to talk about, a little bit about cravings and urges and how to identify them. So a lot of times we'll have cravings and urges and they'll, they'll just pop into our, into our head uninvited, unasked for, they just come into our head. You can be sitting down watching a movie and then you're just like, wait, I want a cookie or I want a glass of wine or something like that. But once you get to identify those cravings and urges, you can also identify the triggers. So for example, if your trigger is having a cupboard, cupboard full of bottles, that could be a trigger because when you open the cupboard, you see all of these bottles of spirits and wine and et cetera. And that's a trigger because you're just like, oh, it's right there. Let me just take a, let me just take a glass or a shot, whatever it is. Um, same thing for me when I open the cupboard or the pantry and I see all these sweets, that for me is a trigger because I'm like, oh, it's right there. It's within reach. I already opened the cupboard. So let me just take a, let me just take one. Um, so sometimes it'll help to identify those triggers and like what is your trigger and then doing things to, re to remove those triggers. So for me, it was clearing out the pantry and instead stocking it with um, better, healthier snacks. Um, still keeping a couple of them because I do wanna indulge myself every now and then, but not every single day or multiple times a day. Um, so other triggers could be you're stuck at home. That is a huge trigger right now because we're in the middle of a pandemic. Where are we gonna go? Especially in the early months, what was it from like March to July? where everything was shut down. And again, like I'm saying, like I was saying the, the tumbleweeds where there was no movement, no life outside and you're stuck at home for blurs day. Um, that could be a trigger as well because you're just like, I have nothing else to do. I'm bored. And I'm keep hearing all of these awful headlines about how many people have died and, you know, so-and-so is in the hospital and stuff like that. That could be a trigger. And so we reach for that, for that advice. We're lonely. That's another huge thing we don't have. Um, very many people to talk to. We're disconnected from our family because one, we can't see them. We can only really talk to them on the phone, um, but they have their own things going on. Friends are stuck at home as well. So we feel lonely. That could be a trigger as well. And so um, to combat that, we need to find ways to kind of like, kind of fill our time, um, fill our time. So it, it, it's still blurs day. The days still run into each other, but I, 
but filling that time with activities that we want to do, maybe picking up a hobby like uh, crocheting or knitting. That's a huge one. Um, that's what my mother-in-law actually does. She makes these beautiful like hats and scarves and that, that's been kind of like her pandemic project is um, knitting and learning all of these different like knots and stuff. I don't even know what it is. It's amazing. I wish I could do it. Um, and stress, of, of course, is another trigger. But when you identify those, those triggers, the more you identify the triggers and the more you're aware of them, the easier it becomes for you to mitigate them and to kind of challenge them and to not act on them. Um, so again, coping with the triggers. So a huge thing that you can do, it's a really great skill to have is setting a reminder for yourself. So reminding yourself, why are you making a change, right? If I'm saying, for example, I'm going to self-disclose. I'll say, I said, well, I want to cut down on all the junk food. I want to cut down on all the sweets. Um, and sometimes when I'm like, oh, I really want a cookie, like a fresh home baked cookie with some ice cream on top. Um, I'll stop and think to myself, well, why, why did I decide to make a change? Why did I decide to commit to eating a little bit healthier and cutting down on my sweets? Um, and I'll remind myself that, um, well, it's because I want to be healthier. Or I want to take care of myself, et cetera. And a re another great, great way of doing that is writing down your reasons, writing them down. Why are you making a change? Writing down all of the reasons why you're doing it to stay healthy for your kids, for your grandkids, whatever it is writing them down and then putting them up somewhere that you can see like on the fridge. Maybe a fridge is a great way because you have it right there. So when you go to reach for the wine or for the beer or for the cake or whatever it is, you're reminded of why you're making the change and why are you committing to it? Um, another great one is challenging it. So if your thought, for example, is one more little drink couldn't hurt, try saying out loud, yes, one more can hurt, and then listing out why it can hurt you. Um, and then simply simply walking away. So like if you're walking and then like to, in your house somewhere and you're triggered by, I don't know, you see a wrapper and you're like like a candy wrapper or something that you're like, oh, I want a couple of candy or a couple, a couple of chocolates. Physically walk away, just walk away. Like don't even question it, don't think about it, just start, start walking the other way. Even if you were going to go there to, to get something completely different, but you're already triggered. So if you just walk away, give yourself a couple of minutes to cool off, get yourself distracted again, and then walk back, uh, that could be another way of kind of coping with the trigger and not acting on it, keeping yourself from acting on it. Um, and I put this slide in because when I was developing this presentation and when I was really thinking about it, I thought about all the elements that uh, that it takes to, to make a huge lifestyle change or to implement healthy habits. And one that stuck out to me was patience. We need patience. And I think, especially as individuals, we don't have a lot of patience with ourselves, especially when it comes to uh, developing a new lifestyle. And it, it makes me think of, you know, January 1st, everyone is like, I'm going to the gym every single day. I'm not going to miss. I'm not going to drink any alcohol. I'm only going to eat spinach and broccoli and I'm not going to have any sweets. And so we put all, all of these really hard and fast stipulations on ourselves. And, and then we get frustrated with ourselves when, excuse me, when we don't, when we miss a day or when we, instead of, instead of broccoli, we maybe have like a scoop of ice cream. We get angry with ourselves and we, um, say all these nasty comments about ourselves and we're so mean to ourselves. And it's because we have no patience. And it's because we have we, we are so rigid and we are our own worst enemy and our own worst critic. And I think we need to have patience with ourselves. And that comes with self-love. So we need to be we need to be patient. A lot of things take time. Same, you know, it takes time to develop a new lifestyle. Because especially when you're in a pandemic and it's been a, it's been an entire year and this is all we've known. And we've, we've kind of settled into a pandemic routine and uh, a pandemic diet and hobbies and stuff like that. It's, it takes, it's going to take time to kind of pull yourself out from under there and implement new habits and new lifestyle changes. 
um, especially during a pandemic, it's incredibly hard. We have all this stress and we have all these other things going on because of the pandemic. And now we're trying to make a lifestyle change. It's going to be much harder, but uh, we just need to have patience with ourselves and um, understand that it takes time and be gentle with ourselves truly. Um, and so under patience, I also put down the 21 day rule. And I'm not sure if any of you have heard of the 21 day rule, but um, a few years ago, it was kind of like all the craze where, you know, everyone was like, well, you only need 21 days to make a lifestyle or a habit change or to implement a habit, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a little bit of a myth. Researchers have been researching it, seeing how long it takes. Obviously for everyone, it's different. For everyone, it's different. Some people, sure, they can do it in 21 days, but on average, it takes a lot longer than that. Um, it, it's around, it's hovering around 66 days to 254 days. Again, it all varies person to person and what they're dealing with, what kind of lifestyle change they want to implement. But um, the 21 day rule, I, I just don't want anyone to hear it in the future and think like, well, it has to be in 21 days and I have to do it in 21 days. And that's all the time I have. And if I don't do it in 21 days, I'm a failure. Absolutely not. That's not what it is. Everyone is different. Everyone is going to implement their lifestyle changes at a different pace than everyone else. Um, so it might take longer, it might take shorter than that, but it's not impossible. You just need to be patient with yourselves and keep trying when you get back up. I mean, when you fall down, keep getting back up and keep trying it. If you had an off day, you still have tomorrow, right? You still have tomorrow to do it, to get better at it, to recoup and to kind of think and reflect, well, what is not working? What is working? And that, that really is the best way to, to implement a habit is really thinking things through, not only thinking about why you're doing it, your reasons why, but also thinking about what's working, what's not working and implementing those changes, little tweaks along the way before you know it, time has passed and it'll be your new normal and you'll be healthier, stuff like that. Um, so that goes along with consistency. As long as you keep at it, you keep reflecting, you keep working at it, you'll get there. Trust me, you'll get there. Time, time is always going to keep going, right? And as long as we keep going with it, we'll get there eventually. And another one that works is breaking down your goal into manageable chunks. Just like I was saying before, where it's like, you know, uh, January 1st, 12.01 a.m., everyone is like, I'm going to the gym every single day for two hours. I'm not going to miss. I'm going to drop 30 pounds by the end of January. Um, I'm only going to eat spinach and broccoli. I'm not going to have any sweets. And we're putting all of these huge goals um, that a lot of the times it's unrealistic. It's much easier if you broaden it. If you're like, okay, I wanna go to the gym and I wanna be healthier. Okay, let's broaden that. Instead of saying, I'm gonna go to the gym every single day for two hours a day. How about, okay, I'm going to try to make it to the gym four to five times this week. A little more realistic because you're an adult, you have a lot of other things going on in your life. And it's really difficult to commit to seven days a week, two to three hours a day in the gym. So instead of saying, I'm going to be doing that, I'm going to try at least four to five days. I'm going to be in the gym at least four to five times a week. And I'm going to eat healthy at least five times a week. And maybe the weekends I'll cheat. So once we start splitting it up and we, we see the overall goal and then we split it up, it's much easier and much more manageable. So for me, for example, my advice is, sugars, like I was saying this whole entire time, sugars, carbs, and stuff like that, instead of cutting them out completely, I know I can't do that. I know I can't cut out the carbs completely. One, I'll be completely miserable. <clears throat> I do need a little bit of carbs to be a little bit healthy. Um, instead of eating them, though, eating them every single day, maybe I'll just eat them three to four times a day, or three or four times a day, three to four times a week, instead of eating them every single day, three to four times a week, I'll eat them. That way, I'm still getting my carb fix making the portion smaller, um, but I'm not cutting it out completely and I'm not miserable and I'm not angry about it. Again, self-compassion goes with the patience. Be gentle with yourself. It's going to be a little hard at first, but be patient because it does take baby steps. Like I was saying, manageable chunks, setting realistic goals. Um, so setting realistic goals where you're like, okay, this month I'm going to go to the gym three to four times a week, every week. And I'm going to eat, you know, healthy, at least four, 
four to five days out of every week. That's a little bit more manageable than saying you're cutting everything out because one, you're going to get frustrated with yourself. If you are, if you miss a day, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be angry with yourself. Um, you're going to be angry. You're going to be irritable. And it just, it's, it's counterproductive. So if you give yourself a little bit of leeway, it's much better because you're, you're trying to slowly ease into it, into this. You're not trying to overhaul your entire life because if any, if anything, you're setting yourself up for failure by doing that, by overhauling your entire life, throwing everything away. Um, so give yourself the best shot at being successful by doing those little baby steps at first. And then before you know it, you've done this complete revamp with your lifestyle and with your health, and it's much better. And always make sure to use kind words kind words with yourself. A lot of times we're, we're our harshest critic and our worst enemy, and we use the harshest words to describe ourselves, but we're human. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have our off days. Just make sure you're kind to yourself and, and, and understand yourself too, that you are doing the best that you can do. Okay. So we have 10 minutes left. Does anyone have any questions, comments, suggestions, whatever is on your mind, you can go ahead and say it right now. Any questions out there? I'll let you could take your screen share off. I'll, I'll just do it for you. Stop screen share. There you go. Okay. All right. Well, that's a lot to take in, but uh, you know, feeling better, feeling like is good news. Like there's a, there's, there's hope and there's a way out. <laughs> um, simple things to change. Right. Does anybody have any questions for Jessica? I don't have any questions, but I can share. No, well, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so my issue was not alcohol. My issue is um, eating junk food. And I definitely put on weight during this uh, year. And um, I hate that. You know, I, I just really like my body to be the way I like my body to be. And uh, I uh, was making a lot of banana bread. And lately I've been buying a lot of Irish bread. Ice cream was my big thing. Ice cream was the big thing. And then, you know, when you're starting to like not even put it in a bowl anymore and you're just eating it right out of the container, you know, that's kind of a wake up call. Um, so I did, uh, I found an old recipe for some vegetable soup from Weight Watchers. It's only 42 calories a cup. So I've made a whole bunch of it. I've got it in the, I've got containers in the freezer and the mm -hmm. fridge. And so now when I like it, want to put something in my mouth because sometimes that's all it is it's not about that it has to be you know a particular candy or a particular brownie or something like that mm -hmm. i make myself that a bowl of that soup and at least it's all vegetables and all mm -hmm. good nutritional stuff and i like your 21 day rule because i'm going to immediately put in my calendar when i started this two days ago and see if i can you know keep it going for three weeks 21 days um mm -hmm. But, uh, but if but, you don't make the 21 but, yeah. days, don't feel bad. Right, right. But but it but it's also because we're in the house all the time, like, just like you said, the refrigerator's right there. The cabinets are right there. But I'm also going to um, reorganize my cabinets. I appreciated you saying that because I definitely could change things around in my pantry and my cabinets in order mm -hmm. to make the junk food harder to reach. Like I could put it way in back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it, I mean, it's still a little wintry out there in Montclair, yeah. but um, the time is, is coming when we will be able to, like, get out the door and go for a walk, go for a swim at the community pool, you know, go and do all that stuff. So um, this was good for me to reassure myself that you know, I wasn't the only one and I just need to now um, take myself on. I do have commitments on the on the fridge like I commit to no more ice cream in the house oh nice yeah I have a little index card on that and I also have a photo of my favorite outfits that require me to be thinner I um, have that too that's yeah so and I have that hanging on my fridge um and then a friend sent me a photo that he took of me recently where I was bigger than I've ever been in my life mm -hmm. <laughs> And he's a good friend. It wasn't mean, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but I do have that also on the fridge as a reminder of, uh, you know, like time to, time to cut that out. 
mm-hmm. had to cut that out. Right. So anyway, thanks. It was it was good to be in this conversation and to remind myself of what I need to do to stay on track and um, some good ideas you gave. Well, thanks thank everybody you. for listening to my personal. No, story. thank you for participating. <laughs> thanks for sharing, Patty. I I actually um, we Trish and I started a, a new diet and um, two weeks ago. And cause I just, it was so frustrating to not fit. And so one of the things I cut out was that like weekly having a glass of wine, that weekly alcohol, you know, wine with dinner, you know, mm-hmm. not only is it expensive, but um, I feel, I felt I would have one glass. I mean, I wouldn't have more than that, but I would feel sleepy, mm-hmm. um, you know? And so I thought, you know, if I just have a cocktail or a glass of wine on the, on a Friday or Saturday night, I'll feel like it's a treat. Um, cause it never was that I wanted to, you know, drink the whole bottle. It was just wanting to have that glass of wine. Um, so I cut that out and that I think was so important for me because I think sugar begets sugar. We're actually having a, um, one of our mill classes, which will start in, uh, mid April is all about like sugar detox and how to detox from sugar, but sugar begets sugar, right? So once you start on that refined Mm -hmm. sugar cycle, you know, carbs and sugar and carbs and sugar, you just, you go down that road. So I would feel really tired and I want to lay on the couch after dinner. And then I would, um, crave, crave more sugar later on. So then I'd start with the snacking thing, like carbs or sugar later on. And without the glass of wine, I'm having seltzer with dinner. I'm not, I'm not looking for dessert. However, this particular diet allows us to have either a half a cup every other day. It's a half a cup or a cup, a half a cup or a cup of, of vanilla ice cream. Oh, nice. I'm not really a big ice cream person. I much prefer chocolate, but vanilla ice cream every other day, getting always getting it, but every other day and half a cup is a lot. When I get a cup of ice cream, I'm like, boy, this is filling. Um, and <laughs> we actually portion it out into our special cups. And then we sit we there because if, if I have some, you know, I'm going to get dirty looks, <laughs> you know, I ate mine already. So we have it together. It's social and it feels like we're getting a treat and we're not going back to the fridge to get the rest of the pint. You know, we're, we're kind yeah. of, we have that half gallon for the, for the week. And then we just scoop it out and we have our portion. And so that portion control, but it, it, it's sort of not depriving ourselves. And then I'm not at 10 o'clock at night. I'm not hungry because I'm really sated by whatever, you know, so I, I haven't started that, that chain, that cycle chain of like wanting to snack. Cause I'm a big snacker. I love snacking. I love salty snacks. Mm. Now my snack, when I get home is just, I have carrots and celery and cucumbers and I just something to chew on. So I'm going to yeah. yeah, sometimes easy. that's all you need to kind of like yeah, well, satisfy it, that you, urge. You want to put something in your mouth. You want to yeah. chew on something, you want to crunch on something. It's just like that action. Mm-hmm. And if it's something healthy, like I like radish chips, I just make little thin slices of radishes and I just kind of, Pop them while I'm cooking dinner. I'm just popping them, you know, because I'm hungry oh, and I can't yeah, wait. That's a good idea. Radish. If you always have, if you always have those healthy go to that stuff ready at the ready, like in little baggies, you know, it's it's kind of like a ritual. Then you can make those the rituals, right? Rather mm-hmm. than the bad stuff, the good stuff, the ritual. Like at night, if you want a snack, you know, get your walnuts or your almonds and have, you know, have a small, but have them portioned out so you have like you know, 15 almonds or 10 walnuts. I mean, you know, we talked about uh, nuts yesterday, but they're very filling. They're f- high in fat, but good fat. Mm-hmm. And they're not going to trigger all the bad stuff that happens when you snack on pretzels, like, you know, <laughs> so it's all, it's, it's, that's good stuff. Um, anybody else have any comments or questions? You know, I, th- this is Anna. I think since yeah. the COVID, I have, um, really have because of the Edgemont classes become somewhat more healthy because we have the exercise classes we have the move and groove class did you just mute yourself Anna mm-hmm. you just muted yourself Anna you moved you muted yourself unmute yourself there you go okay I was gifted with an apple watch by my son and daughter-in-law and now I, I make sure that I go for my walk every day, or at least most days, and that I do get in my, my 10,000 steps, my five miles plus 
uh, per, uh, per day. And um, I don't know. I, I, I think that um, I, I'm healthier now than I was pre-COVID. I really do think so. And uh, I converted my, uh, my 12 by 12 little porch into a mud room. So that was a project, you know, and cool. I've been refinishing some of my furniture pieces, some chairs and um, a, a barber cabinet. So I've been busy. I've been busy. Every so often, though, I do get a little depressed. <laughs> I, I will say that. Another thing that I've done is I do prefer white wine, mm -hmm. but uh, in one of the classes that we had, they mentioned the uh, red wine. Mm -hmm. So what I do is I do have my glass of red wine at five o'clock every day. And that's, that's fine. You know? mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make the best of what it is, you know, and right now it's not that great. You know? mm -hmm. So. That, yeah, that's it. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Anna. Um, yeah, we talked uh, about the benefits, the antioxidant benefits of that, the red wine, really. Mm -hmm. The white wine is just, you know, it's not as, it's, it's not, you're not, you're not getting that color. Remember, we talked about the blueberries, right? And the, right. the grapes and all those antioxidants, like pomegranate juice. You're not getting that with white wine. So you, you, you really are better off if you're going to have a glass of wine. It, and, and we we're talking about this in our next group is um, the uh, the blue zones. You know, people that uh, the Sardinians. Last week we talked about the Sardinians, right, right, uh, in in Italy that they drink like the longest living people in Sardinia drink a glass of wine. A lot of Italians drink a glass of wine every day, um, sometimes two glasses. But they have wine with their main meal, which is usually lunch. But they're having a glass of wine, and it's really deep, rich cherry color. All that antioxidants is really so if you it outweighs the little bit of you know actually probably less stress for your heart overall is when you're less stressed and so if you get take that little bit of an edge off yeah that's self medicating for sure but it's when you're getting schnockered you know and having like a <laughs> and then you you drink it at lunch and then you're you're sweeping right into dinner time that's 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 a problem <laughs> i'm also trying not to eat like these prepackaged type foods you know Mm -hmm. these processed foods and just making whatever from scratch. Even if that is that zucchini bread, <laughs> at least it will be from scratch as opposed to right. all the preservatives and whatever that, you know, come with the packaged products. Sure, sure. But anybody else have a comment? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Jessica. We really appreciate it. And um, we will be, um, we'll be on top of this for sure. Thank, thank you. you.